Welcome guys to Higher Perspective. I'm Lee Purcell and here I got Alex Kruder. He's a good friend and co-founder of Kirby, which is Canada's first fully licensed online vehicle retailer. And they've been in operation since 2017. How you doing, Alex? <laughs> doing really good. Thanks for having me on your show. Uh, Thanks for being on here, brother. Uh, it seems like too long since uh, we got to hang out, but uh, I'm definitely happy that Zoom can bring us together. It's cool, hey? It's cool, it's possible. <laughs> definitely. Speaking of possibilities, uh, what's really amazing is while the world's kind of slowed down and stopped, it seems like you're moving forward, you're propelling, and you're speeding up. <laughs> and that's what's possible in your mind and you're making it happen to me that's absolutely intriguing yeah um you know there's a there's a, a saying that i first heard i don't even know who coined it but uh, it was a buddy of mine uh during the last economic uh, the, the, the financial crisis from 10 years ago or whatever it was uh he was saying he's talking to uh, a, a federal politician and uh, he was advocating that they, you know, during the financial crisis, they should spend more money on the environment. They should spend more money on a bunch of things to transform the country. And uh, his rationale, as he said, uh, never let a good crisis go to waste. Ooh. And um, yeah, and so, and I know that he didn't invent that, that, that quote, but he's right. You know, never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, when you're talking about I don't know. There's, it's funny how this stuff works, but you're, all of these crises are also a crisis of identity because like there's change that's in the wind. And, um, you know, when you're faced with, uh, there's another saying I actually really like a lot. And it's, um, if you're the same after the tempest as you were before, you missed the point of the tempest. <laughs> you're allowing yourself to just evolve through whatever shows up, Ed. <laughs> well, there's very little you should hold on to, I find. So I had a friend of mine. Uh, he asked me, uh, he's very accomplished. He's, uh, he's, a, he's a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, he uh, went to, um, he did his undergrad at Dartmouth, so at Ivy League school. Yeah. And then he eventually got on, went to do medicine at, uh, at Harvard. And now he's, uh, he's a professor uh, at, at Harvard, runs a, he also runs a, a neuroscience uh, well, their neuroscience research over there. And uh, he asked me one day, he said, uh, so um, how, do you, how do you know when to give up on something? And so I wasn't sure if he was talking about their, like the, the, his chosen field, you know, because there's, there's certain research that he was doing or, or, or if he was just asking generally. But he got me thinking and I thought, like, how do you know? You know, because yeah. I know there's a lot of if you listen to, to gurus, out, well, I shouldn't say gurus, but there's just there's a lot of advice out there for entrepreneurs all the time to, to that to be that dog with a bone to never stop pushing to never give up. But I can tell you that it, that in and of itself, that is poor advice. You have to know every single day whether you should be giving up on something. Because what you don't see is if you don't give up on things that aren't actually working. So be critical. You have to be willing to change. If you can't give up on the things that aren't working, you won't be able to do the things that will work. So you always have to be willing to, to change tack. So in, in the startup world, we call this pivoting. And uh, what, what tends to lead to a lot of pivoting is uh, when you pitch your business to investors and you get negative feedback. And so once you start learning how to do is refine your sales pitch, and you begin developing something that the market has an appetite for. And then once you have those investors, you do the same thing with customers. You'll, you'll try to figure out how to reach them to give them what you believe is a good service, but they'll give you feedback. You know, they'll tell you right away if what you're doing is right or if it's wrong. And if it's not right, don't keep hammering away at it, <laughs> telling the market that it's wrong. Follow what they're saying, take every single nugget and transform yourself and provide something of value. And so, and so this is the whole thing. It's like, now we find ourselves in this, uh, this situation with the pandemic and, you know, not wanting to, you want to change with the storm, you know, uh, because if you don't, you miss an opportunity. So the question is, how do you do that properly? Like, what does transformation look like? You know, how do you get wings? How do you become that butterfly? And I'll tell you right now, like the whole trip towards these things, it's kind of the scariest thing possible. No doubt. No doubt. <laughs> What enables you to see it from such a neutral perspective? <laughs> well, 
Well, I think so. We've 2017 is when we founded. So we incorporated in January of that year. Um, and before we launched, and so we had, it was actually a very accelerated pathway to, to market for us. So this was everything from developing our initial, um, the first draft of our technology, our branding, uh, our messaging. And um, actually, maybe that's where it began, to be honest. Like now that I'm thinking about it, we, um, we had to, well, I, I had preconceived notions all the way along of how this business would come together. And so one after another, those preconceived notions just got the hell kicked out of them. And uh, <laughs> we had to, pivot, <laughs> had to pivot and adapt. And, you know, there was a lot of ego in it too, um, because, uh, and it caused like, it was amazing, but like, there was a lot of discomfort that happened. Um, and, it, and it's partly because, you know, I came from the finance world, you know, and I thought that um, I could, I, I, my, my business partner, he's a car guy. And so the way that I saw it was, you know, he had the car part you know, nailed down. I can get the rest of it. And I thought that I had a very good handle on how the finance world works. But it turns out the finance world, just like everything else, once you get into it, the devil's in the details. And so when we started getting into um, how the finance world works in the automotive space or just even the tech space, it was a different a world I didn't recognize. And so and I had to accept the fact that there were surprises around every corner because if I didn't, then I wouldn't adapt properly, you yeah. know, or I might get stuck on something. So just like the um, iterating on a sales pitch or just like trying to find an investor, when it came down to even the simple things like finding a bank that would underwrite loans for our customers, you know, you had to be willing to go and just take the barbs. And so that meant a lot of no's, you know, a lot of phone calls. You know, we probably called 30 banks to go deal with us yeah. and none of them were interested. And so, you know, and, and they wouldn't tell us exactly why it's just policy, but you know, with enough phone calls and enough due diligence, you figure out what's going on. So it became easy to, uh, it became easier, I should say, with time to start letting that stuff go. Because what I realized is there's so little that's in my control. The only thing I can really do is I can sit here and I can keep learning as I go and I can try to make the most intelligent uh, choices that I can given what I know. Um, and so then there's like a, a process of forgiveness, you know, it's just like, ah, you don't have to know these things before you jump in the first time, you know, in spite yeah. of what you believe, you know, right. Um, <clears throat> and so then, uh, and, and that became a practice all the way along because at least I believe anyway, because we, um, there were many things we never knew. Like once we had finally had money to get the company started, then it was, uh, well, how do you sell a car online? You know, like we just realized that was amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> you know? And anyway, and so that, and that's the thing. It's like, there's just, there, there are all these issues along the way, uh, or it's like, you know, oh, there's regulations. Like, what, what are they? You know, how do we follow them? Anyway, and, and you know, it, it turns out that, uh, that there isn't really, there, no one knows these things. You know, wow. it's like, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's very strange. Like even, you know, where we started our business, the regulations are, are located in like three different places and there isn't one contiguous, you know, document that goes through them all. So what you find out is that you kind of trip over a few of these things. You, you break the rules from time to time unwittingly and then you learn. But there's forgiveness in everything. Like no one's there to shut you down. They're there to get you on the right path and compete properly. And so what we found is that there's a, it's a softer process than you think. And rushing towards a conclusion never has never benefited us it's always been a lot better to sit back and just be patient um if there's a even a deal you know a customer is like i gotta have this thing in 15 minutes and you know that it's almost impossible because just the way that we're structured at that time don't rush because here's the problem you really risk giving a bad experience and so then it costs you more than if you and plus it's you know you might not be able to do it at the time for any cost. You know, it's going to be too expensive. Don't worry about it. There's another customer out there somewhere. Um, or just, or maybe there's a way to, 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 to adjust things so that it fits what you can do. And all of these things work this way. And so it's, it's amazing how, I don't know, I just patience, patience became a virtue. And so anyway, three years, of, uh, of, of, of stubbing my toe on everything, bumping into all the corners uh, all over the place and 
constantly being realizing I don't know anything or know enough uh, is led to a place where I can feel more comfortable, I should say, not knowing what the, the future holds. Wow, man, that, that's incredible. So you just dove in without fully knowing what you were doing and it's <laughs> perpetuating for you. Yeah, well, here's the thing. Um, I think when it comes to business and entrepreneurship, I think we all, I don't think any entrepreneur gets involved without thinking they know what they're doing. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. That makes, sense. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. So you thought you knew what you were doing and only yeah. realized that you had no clue what you're actually stepping into. Yeah. Like it, it's interesting, but yeah. I, I, I truly believe that as a, you know, as, as a founder anyways, um, between my business partner and me, and just knowing all the other entrepreneurs I've gotten to know in the last three years, if any of us really had an idea of what was coming down the pike or how hard this would be or what we would have to do, or just honestly, it would just even simply the gap, the gap between where we are and where we have to be. I don't think you do these things. It's cause it, it's, it just seems too daunting and too yeah. challenging. Um, <laughs> like, if you had, you know, if I would have had any conception of the emotional roller coaster, like I didn't realize that like the, the process of creation, what like building something was such an emotional ride. I just never would have appreciated that. But like, yeah, cause everything, everything I've ever built for this company has, I've been, it's been a piece of me, you know, and it gets judged all the time. You know, every single customer has their own thought. Every single investor has their own, their own, their own take or opinion on things. And so that you can't have sacred cows because otherwise you're just, you know, at the end of the day, you're just full of arrows from yeah. all of these people, you know? Yeah. So. And all of that's rational yet. There's so many people that once they hit one of those obstacles, you know, they want to protect their sacred cow and step away. And a lot of people walk away in fear because it is overwhelming. It is daunting. It is all this stuff. What enables you to move forth, to step out? I'm going to say step out of the emotion because you, you, you really, I mean, I'm sure it's its own emotional process, but here you are still showing up, still making it happen, still moving forward, still pushing. That alone is inspiring. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, it's, <laughs> you know, um, I think the thing is, well, I don't know exactly what drives me, to be honest. I keep asking this question. <clears throat> A good friend of mine, uh, his name is Riley Iverson. He, uh, you know, he, he runs a startup company as well. Uh, he's making some a transition uh, these days. Yeah. Uh, and this idea of motivation, like what drives, what drives a person, in his case, what drove him to be a startup founder, uh, an entrepreneur, is something that he's been mulling for in, in a tremendous amount of detail and seriousness for a while now. Um, and I'm not sure. I can tell you that there, for me, um, just listening to him anyways, there is a part of it that's addictive. I know this for sure, mm -hmm. because at least in our experience, uh, in his, some of his experience matches my own. And I would say that <clears throat> we've probably had more highs and lows, more of a roller coaster that, a ride than he has had. But there's, there's a, an inherent trajectory up, you know. Uh, every single low is higher than the previous low, and all the new highs are higher than the previous high so far and um and that's nice like it's it's it feels really good to keep succeeding um it also feels really good when you stare the you know, devil in the face and uh and you're able to stand your ground you know or Ooh. um it feels incredible to um it feels incredible to to make what you know is a hard call you know like for us right now just like every other startup company out there, you know, we have a limited runway in terms of cash. And unfortunately, like this was the year that we set ourselves up so that, you know, we would have a lot to, to receive venture capital funding. And I mean, this is like, we're not alone in this. Like every startup company finds themselves on this treadmill. And there's a part where you have to raise a larger round in order to scale up. Mm -hmm. And so we got to the place where uh, our financials, like the results from, um, from the sales that we were producing, got us into a place where uh, we're making enough on every car and we're selling enough of our inventory uh, in, a, in a given period of time to become a break-even business. And so that becomes a company you can scale. 
What allows you to get the money to scale though, is that you have to have a, a, enough of a track record to, to, to give that confidence that they'll invest in you. And so, and that was what we were setting up for, to, for this year. Our sales season begins in April and it ends in November. And due to COVID-19, we don't have that sales season right now. And moreover, it's not just that people are not leaving their houses, it's that a lot of people lost their jobs. And so the, the amount of <laughs> the consumers missing in this equation, they'll come back someday, but they're just not here now. And so the question is, what do you do in our situation? No doubt. The fact that you're even asking, what do you do right now? You know what I mean? <laughs> that alone is, is, is absolutely phenomenal because it's not like, oh, there's no customers, so I have to shut down. You're just like, oh, what do I do to move forth? <laughs> well, the thing is, like, <laughs> you know, when you find yourself in a hole, the one thing you want to avoid is trying to dig up because you, <clears throat> you start digging further into the hole, right? Yeah. So the question is, you know, how is it that you find your way out of the hole? And so the, the thing for us is to chase that value. And uh, so we always look at the, I always look at the business, I should say, from the vantage point of an investor. Like, what would make me want to be in this business tomorrow? Because like, you can always stop, right? Like we have cash sitting in the, in the account. We could just stop everything and we could return the money, you know? Because we, we could just say, you know what? We tried, it didn't work out very well. You can always get off, you can always get off the merry-go-round if you want, you know? <laughs> There's no one keeping us here, wow. you know? So we can, but, you know, is there a better path it, you know, then, then shutting down and returning the money that we can. And I think that there, and it's, and for me, I, I know, you know, some people would say, think of the employees and things like that. And we totally do. Like these people are, everyone that works at Kirby is tight. We're friends, but we're here to build something. We're here to change the world. And so you can always, again, you can shut it down. You can pivot the business into something else. You can, there's lots of things you can do. Like you, a lot of control in these situations. And so, and sometimes shutting down does make sense. You know, it's like, why be in business when the customer is not there? Let's wait. You know, let's yeah. wait for them to come back. You know, you, you do, it's like, anyway, like there's no sense in beating your head against the wall. Yeah. Um, and we've been through this before. Like we went through a period where, um, a period where we, we, we literally ran out of cash. There was investment that was, that was coming into Kirby and it arrived five and a half months late. And all the way along, it didn't make sense to go find different funding uh, because the timeline was too short. It was also indeterminate. We didn't know how long the money would take to arrive because it had already been committed. Uh, it was coming from, in our case, a government source, but we were missing the market that year. And it turns out that, you know, just by being patient and kind of enjoying the summer instead of trying to beat ourselves up in a situation where we couldn't do anything, just like calm down, take some time off. That might be the reason why we're still in business today because the money came in later. Now the business is still here. COVID-19 has hit. And unlike most of our peers, we have liquidity. So we can stay in business. Wow. So for us right now, like the question is, well, what do you do? Um, like the goal was always to build enough value in the business so that we could get that larger financing round closed in, um, in the fall. And, and so if the, the part that built, uh, built value in the business was supposed to be a track record of sales. And that track record of sales was supposed to show profitability, or sorry, I should say profitability per unit. It was really supposed to show a scalable business. Yeah. And right now, because the consumer's gone, the market isn't there, it's very challenging to, to do that. Showing growth is very hard right now, too. Yeah. So what's the next most important thing you can do? Well, in our case, it's to get rid of all the other limitations that we have. So, you know... Uh, you have to be licensed to sell vehicles in a different province. And so we're getting licenses in all the other provinces so we can unlock more markets to, to sell into. That means that if we can market more our vehicles to more people, the idea being they become more liquid. There's just more potential buyers out there. So that's the first thing that we do. Whereas our traditional competitors in our space, they also sell cars, but they're limited. They tend to operate uh, in, in one market alone because they have a physical presence. And they also don't tend to, to market outside that market. And that's the whole thing. They don't advertise outside that market. So they're kind of stuck. So those local market dynamics are challenging for them, less so for us. And so we open up new markets. And the second thing is we need more to sell. And this is a good time for us too, because to get more to sell, our, com our competitors, they uh, our traditional competitors, I should say, they find themselves in many cases unable, unable to operate. They, you know, they lay either they've closed their doors 
or they've laid off 70 to 90 percent of their staff yeah and they've got millions of dollars in vehicles sitting on their lots depreciating and cars depreciate quickly you have to roll these things over quickly so now we have so the way that we view it is if we're looking for more things to sell why not become become of service to our competitors to help them get out of their jam and maybe if we can help them sell their cars maybe when this whole thing passes they don't want to sell they don't want to hire back all their salespeople. maybe they want to sell some of their cars through us and that becomes a permanent thing you know so and what we're we've, we've long believed that the market that we have today uh, in, in the automotive sector it's very fragmented there's about eight, almost 8,000 competitors across Canada. So kind of like um, one car dealership for every 5,000 people. Yeah. There aren't many markets in the country that are this hyper competitive. And so the thing is when they're, the, uh, and it's very territorial, we know that consolidation has to take place and it's not really taking place yet. There may have to be bankruptcies or something, but the market it's, it's too crowded to begin for, for what it is right now. Yeah. The dealership, the dealership operating model is also inefficient. You can't have all these really small dealerships, mom and pop shops all over the place uh, that all have their their reconditioning centers, that all have their own showrooms, that all have their own individual inventory, that all have their own like sales staff. All of the uh, or employees, I should say, uh, administration systems, advertising, like it's so much. It's crazy. It's got to be rationalized. Yeah. And so what we see in our minds is. There should be, you know, instead of each dealership selling, say, a few hundred cars a year, so the average dealership in Canada sells four to 500 cars a year, we think they should be selling tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of cars per year. And so instead of having, you know, thousands and thousands of dealerships, maybe it's more like hundreds, and maybe it's more like less than that. And so the idea is, how do you affect transition to get there? You have to help the entrepreneurs who are currently in that space find a way to rationalize their companies. And yeah. so it's this thinking of working with your, your, um, with your competitor, you know, to make an, to affect an outcome that's good for everybody that we've had since day one, which is how come the largest round of funding we received at the beginning was from a competitor. Yeah. So it's like, you know, anyway, just openness. Wow. To all the, it's, you know, we're not here to destroy the market or our competitors. We're here to offer a really good service. And if we can help people out, I think having friends along the way is a really good way to go. Yeah, like you're providing oxygen for people who can't breathe right now, basically. I think so. That, and the fact that you're able to see it that way is absolutely profound. It's, it's revolutionary for a specific industry. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It really is because like these, a lot of these places are shutting down and a lot of these people aren't thinking like you. So then they will shut down and you might actually be that life raft for a lot of these people who are going to be going under. I hope so. It, yeah. It's like, I think build value everywhere. You know, it's, yeah. um, I think it's a, it, it's a good, I should say, follow the value. That's how, you know, that's how you build a strong business. And I think that again, it's, um, you know, I don't know, it's um, make yourself of service in some way. And that's where the value is. And so, you know, it's challenging. I mean, it, you know, we're small, <laughs> we're very small, yeah. um, trying to compete with these, uh, these, the larger incumbents, and like the, all the guys that own these dealerships are, they're millionaires, like they're very well healed. Uh, they're not organized, that's for sure. But, you know, the ones, that, but if we tried to call them out and tried to take them on, uh, they would bury us. You know, yeah. I mean, I just, I think it could, it could easily happen. So, excuse me, it makes far more sense to be cooperative uh, wherever we can. Um, and then we're not, you know, and again, this is a very hyper competitive market. The last thing the market needs is one more competitor, right? Like that doesn't solve the industry's problem. The industry's problem is it needs a lower cost operating model. That's the whole thing. Yeah. And so that's where we come in to go and overlay or transform. Um, However, we, we do have the benefit of having operated as our own dealership for three years now. And we've learned a lot of lessons that go with it. And what that means is every piece of technology and every single solution we've ever come up with, and we have many of them now, has been born in the industry and has been designed from the perspective of someone that's been trying to sell cars. And that's exactly what's missing from most of the technology in our space because it's been developed by people in an ivory tower somewhere. 
that they're not part of the sector. They don't know what being in a dealership is like. And so anyway, this is it. Like it's, you know, there's just, there's a lot of information and experience that we end up gathering because of the, the road that we've tra traveled. And uh, again, a lot of it comes down to uh, having to let go of, of, of a lot of ideas and notions along the way, uh, stubbing those toes, banging those shins and, you know, hitting every corner as you go. Yeah. But I think, uh, but if you're willing to do the work and take damage like a superhero, I kind of think that at the end of the day, you can get somewhere. At least this is my bet. You know, Absolutely. I, I, I'm betting on this and we'll see. Like how many muscle fibers do you think Arnold Schwarzenegger tore apart? just to get where he's at. Oh man. You know, like uh, what's your sense on this Lee? Uh, yeah. Actually, you, you, you brought up the, uh, uh, you know, um, train physical training. Yeah. So in life, um, apart from physical training, but uh, you know, you can talk about um, having to transform the self to get stronger as an individual. Mm -hmm. How much of like that, uh, the analogy of working out and tearing muscle fibers and uh, to re so that your body can be rebuilt and get stronger, do you think applies to, you know, the more esoteric nature or parts yeah. of growing as a human? It's been the most practical analogy and permission slip that enables me to continue to move forth. Like, um, yeah. I, I got up to 212 push-ups once, right? What? In one wrong. shot? in a row. I was so just in that driven mindset every day. I'm doing push-ups, doing push-ups, doing push-ups, doing push-ups. And, oh. <laughs> um, and I learned something valuable from that. <clears throat> what I learned is it's not necessarily about, cause I can get to 500. I can get to 300. Like if I didn't stop, you know what I mean? There, there's a world record. Somebody got to, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of push-ups. And uh, this has been a big, um, aspect of my life, pushing myself, pushing myself, pushing myself for quantity, 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 quantity. And what yeah. I learned from doing 212 pushups was I can get better results doing 10 or 20 phenomenal pushups. Ah, uh, okay. And um, what that has taught me to do in life now has slow down and really refine myself. Mm -hmm. and, and, and work on these small little details of, of my life. And um, this is where I see working out as, um, as such a huge analogy, especially if I'm able to, to push it to a level that I haven't been able to before and, and I'm able to see results. And then, and typically that's a result of consistency. And uh, I'm sure yeah. you can see that within yourself. As you've been consistent on this path, growing your business and whatnot, you're seeing greater results and you're learning along the way. I got a friend, um, Gula, she, I'm going to be talking to her, I think Monday. And, um, she's a, um, a world champion gymnast and she was Cirque du Soleil for 13 years. And I remember a couple of years ago talking to her and after a couple of decades, she's still discovering new muscles in her body. <laughs> you know, it's just like, That's wow, amazing. how much is there to learn? So physical, um, physical exercise has taught me so much about mm -hmm. what I am capable of doing because what I've noticed is, um, this is why I'm so intrigued with what you're doing is because you're walking all the philosophy that successful, like a lot of successful businessmen talk about, especially on the internet, YouTube, you know what I mean? Stuff like that. If you break down what you're doing, um, you know, like you're, you're walking all this philosophy that so many people are talking. You're actually <laughs> living, breathing, you're embodying it. And then it's, it's absolutely inspiring to me. And I see what's actually going on and I see where you're heading with that because these skills that you're acquiring along the way and it, it is, it's so intriguing to me because so many of us, myself included, have hit roadblocks and stopped at times where you've hit a roadblock and you've either realized when the right time is to stop. And that's what I want to ask you about as well but also know when to, when to pivot and when to move forward, but ask yourself the right questions. How can I keep going? How can I, okay, here's this. You're able to see life's chaos. Yeah. And you're able to, to, to go, okay, what am I going to do with this? How can I move yeah. forward using what I have? And that's like, um, I remember hearing a story of the Honda guy, the guy who started up the Honda motor companies where he got bombed twice. His factory got bombed in the rubble twice. <laughs> but that yeah. would be devastating. Like you'd wow. be done. And yeah. what he chose to do was he chose to see the metal from these bombs as gifts from God. 
And wow. he took the metal and that's how he started refurbishing his motors to create what Honda is today. And I'm glad I use that analogy because it's you know, the car industry. And, uh, but with that mindset, he was able to just accelerate when he was bombed into rubble. And so I'm super wow. inspired by people that are able to see opportunity, that are able to see the path still moving forward, or at least see themselves as capable of moving forward amongst <laughs> anything. And you're one of those people right now. You're, you're moving forward when so many people have slowed down right now. And the way you break it down, it also makes practical sense. So it's not like you're just, you know, like running in trying to lift all these dumbbells. Like there's a, there's a real practical structured sense to the drive that you're utilizing right now. You know, um, it's, I think one thing that really helps a lot is um, being okay with doing nothing, uh, like taking a break. So for example, I don't think that any of the things I'm talking about right now I would be okay doing if I didn't also think I'd be fine if, if we if we shut the whole thing down. Uh, so on the one hand, you know, it's um because there's a the mind loves to want to do something, you know, it just it loves to need to hold, you know, just I gotta find an angle, I gotta do a thing. But none of those things mean anything uh, unless you're comfortable. I, in my vantage point, I, as you were speaking, I just remembered um I remembered that with all the with this with this crisis and with previous crises at the company, um, like the one where the one with the, where we were, were last summer, and we um, you know kind of took the summer off. It was an interesting thing because doing nothing was was very uncomfortable because you you know always continuously wanted to just burn energy. And, and find a, another route out of the thing and totally tried to do that for a while. And the, eventually it just wasn't possible. And then eventually it was impractical. And so it was, it was, it was, it took a while for like the logical mind to reason, to realize that you just got to sit here for a while, Like that's all you're doing. Take some holidays and just like be okay using this as a time to recharge yeah. because you know, it's coming. You know, like you know, you're going to be back at this, and it's going to be busy and stressful. Make yourself ready. And there was a lesson in all of that that we're using today, and it's that we know that this the pandemic will eventually pass. We have to be more ready when the pandemic is over than we were before, and, and that's really what it comes down to. It's making sure that we um, that we have a better company and we're better positioned after the pandemic passes than we than we were before. Because if we don't do that, then we haven't built any value. And that's a, that, that's a tragedy for us because then we, then we aren't an investable company and we can't make it to the next stage. And so we, we, do, have, we do have resources left and we're actually relative to most companies of our, of our stage, we're better capitalized. So we're in a good position and, and there are many things that we can do. But I also know that if we couldn't come up with anything to do, I would, I would be okay with taking time off and doing huge. nothing. That's so huge. You know, just yesterday I was um, reflecting on like what you're saying, um, being okay with doing nothing. And um, lately I've always been, you know, I've been trying to find something to do, trying to find something to do, or I'm feeling lazy in my own mind. And just yesterday it came to me that those moments where I'm feeling lazy, I could be going inward. And that would be one of the most proactive things I could do. I could yeah. sit and I could meditate and I could really just, gain my center again and sometimes doing nothing is actually the most proactive thing that somebody could do for themselves there's so much to gain um i forget the guy's name but he wrote that book um the diamond cutter and i think i was telling you about him before and um he actually said because he built a 250 million dollar business based on some buddhist principles that he learned at an ashram in india yeah and he was saying if you can understand the concept of emptiness you can build a 200 million dollar company no problem and he said it so calm and casually, like it was no big deal. Like, yeah, you can ride that tricycle. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I mean, I hope to understand emptiness one day, you know? I think, um, but I agree. It's, I, I, I think that there's something in there. It's, um, yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a trap. It's a, it's a mental trap to think that we always have to act, you know, have to do something. Um, 
anyway, it's, it's something to, to, to think about and evaluate because doing something is, is a distraction. You know, it can be productive, but it's a distraction. It, it's, yeah. um, I, it's interesting, like, apart from, you know, looking at, say, physical activity and how that tears the body down so the body can become stronger uh, and how that's analogous to tearing down the identity uh, so that the, the person can become stronger more than they were before. I think that there's also this idea of balance. And I've been, it's been a, a very uh, enlightening thing to become more comfortable with, or at least the way that I, I've become comfortable understanding balance. So for example, it occurred to me a while ago that there's a difference between needing money and having money. You can have money and not need it, you know? And, and, that's, and that's, I think, a, a big deal. Um, so it, it became easiest with money. And the, the reason was that oftentimes I find that uh, I, I was very much guilty of this in the past. Um, I never seemed to have enough money and I needed more because I was never, and I, I needed more to be comfortable. But it turned out I had lots of money. <laughs> I was actually doing okay. <laughs> you know? But and, and having that money, and this was uh, when, when the switch flipped, it was when I was able to, uh, it was after I ended up leaving, working, uh, working for the government. I was at uh, Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. I got downsized there. And I fought the initial urge to go look for another job immediately. And I knew that I was kind of burned out and it had nothing to do with my job. It was just, it was very, very much more a personal thing. In my life, I had I, I funneled my way uh, career-wise into a place I didn't belong. Fortunately, it was a, it was a great place to be. It just didn't match me. And this caused a lot of internal stress. But part of it was because I went there because there was more money. You know, there was, just, there was more money to be had. And I thought that was a good thing, even though I wasn't driven there by my heart. Anyway, so if I can, uh, I'm going to lose my train of thought probably through this story. That's so okay. That's okay. Up. But what I ended up finding was um, it was very challenging to, to give myself the time just to take off and recharge. The only productive thing I could really do was actually very little. Um, so that, that, you know, that forced me to, um, forced me to, to, to recharge and actually reorient my life. And so then when it came down to money, I realized money was one of my fears. And uh, one reason I hadn't chosen to go take the entrepreneurial path earlier, uh, even though I'd been running small companies in there all over the place, like I love building things. One of the reasons why I didn't do it was because I was concerned about seeing the money in my bank account go down because it takes time to get traction and actually build something. Yeah. I didn't want to put something at risk, you know? And so, and so what I realized was the money, the money was controlling me. You know, it was no longer a benefit anymore. Ooh. It wasn't helping me get where I needed to go. And so I, it, it was, I was, it was like, an, you know, it's like alcohol. A yeah. lot of people can drink it and have fun with it. Some people, they need it, you know? And that was what I what money was for me at that time. I needed it, and so I was like holding on to it. And it was I wasn't letting money get me the goods and the services and the growth that I needed as a human. And so when I finally it was it was a whole thing, but I eventually decided to cut myself. It was a ten thousand dollar check I was giving to a software developer to build me a platform for a business I never <laughs> operated at the end of the day. And I thought, I just have to do this because I know if I don't get past this, whatever this impediment is in my life now, um, then I, I'm never going to be able to write a bigger check later or even propel myself forward. And so I, I wrote that check, I would say, with 99% certainty that it was just money down the toilet. But it was incredible what the transformation personally I got out of it. And it only cost me $10,000. It gave me my life back. You know what I mean? So, and that was one of the steps along the way. I love how you say at the end of it, it only cost me $10,000 because I bet when you wrote the check, you weren't thinking about it like that. Yeah. <laughs> when, I, when I wrote the check, it was funny. The guy's like, he says, well, you can just pay me in installments. And I was like, nope, here's the full amount. And then he's like, uh, okay, well, you know, it's okay. You don't have to give me all of it today. Like you can, I don't know. I mean, wow. about half now. And I was like, no, 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 here, take all, take all of it. <laughs> He was, was almost like, uncomfortable I, accepting the full amount because he's not used to that. Yeah, totally. <laughs> wow. So that, that, that's a cool way to look at it because um, even though you, like, you know, I, I was talking to a guy a couple of years ago who had inherited a million dollars and okay. um, 
that became his biggest burden because everybody knew he had a million dollars. He wanted to make sure he did the right things with it. He didn't want to piss it away. Like there was all of this mental chatter and it became his, a, a huge burden for him, a big stress. He didn't know what to do with it. He didn't know how to use it properly or wisely. And he was afraid of actually losing it. So it began wow. to be the factor that controlled his life. That, okay. So I, 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 under, I think I get this. Uh, and I, I have, um, anyway, we can, <laughs> we can diverge from me into some of my musings if you want, because uh, I have some thoughts on, on how, on what he's going through is not unlike a lot of other people with, with money. Yeah. And um, one thing, uh, so I'm a CFA charter holder. So I used to work at, I used to work with investments a lot. And one thing that the, they teach you as you go through the program is that people who are wealthy uh, are concerned with not making more money so much as they are with just capital preservation. So it's like, once you're rich, you want to stay that way. And that, and that's, that's just, that's thematically how it works. Yeah. What the implication though is for our society is that the people who are best able to bear the risk of say innovation, for instance, or which are risky investments, uh, don't want to make those investments. The rich people don't invest in things that get them further ahead. Uh, they invest in things that preserve capital. And so that means like government bonds, it's uh, infrastructure, real estate, pro you know, public private partnerships. And so these things are all great. Like society definitely needs these things. It's just that we also need to move ahead. Yeah. And so because they're not taking the risks, you know, by and large to go invest in these, these new businesses uh, and these new ideas, that responsibility falls on the people who are less able to go and withstand and take wow. the risk of those things. Kind of like the baton's been passed. Well, it is. It's just that, I mean, my vantage point is I would say it's, a, it's, it's an irresponsible way to structure ourselves. Like, I don't think that we should, we should be relying on the people who are least able to go, the poorest among us, essentially, no doubt. to go and help elevate the entire society. Because it, it, to me, it, 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 it smacks of a lack of responsibility. You know, um, I would say that it, because if you have the means, I think that, we, that leadership involves nurturing not just people in our lives, but it's the new businesses and ideas. And so there's got to be like, yes, we can put money into charities. Yes, we can be benevolent. And there's, I think philanthropy could be a great thing too. I don't have a ton of opinions on that stuff. But I do know that when we talk about the futures of economies, it needs nurturing and money and leadership and guidance and all these things. Uh, but, and that's not, classically speaking anyways, what these individuals like to deliver. Um, for some reason, that has to come from the people who have to gamble. You know, the people who are trying their best to elevate themselves within the society, they have nothing really to lose because, you know, so they're, they're, they will risk everything on a new yeah. idea. Yeah. Wow, dude. That, 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 it's like a pioneer way of thinking because you're already doing it. Like you're thinking of ways to help your competitors, to help the people in the industry. Like you're thinking of all this stuff while still growing your business. There's so many factors you're able to consider here. And it, it, you, you're, I can tell you're really looking to benefit the whole out of this equation. The, it's, it's funny, like, uh, so I'm, I'm 40, 41 now as of uh, December. And um, I never saw myself as, uh, as weird as a grown up for a long time. Uh, but I was really happy. And, and that, was, that was to my detriment, you know? Yeah. I, I, never, I, never, felt, I never felt like a 40 year old, you know? Yeah. And, but what I've discovered, but as I've become, as I've become aware of like, you know, where I am uh, and, and who I am and then gain comfort with um, just even things like the experiences that I've had in life, I, I realized that it's incumbent on, like there has to be an amount of sharing that happens. There has to be an amount of, uh, um, of coaching and guidance and just leadership, right? And so, and it's, I, I find that there are, there are many, especially in the business world, uh, many leaders out there that, that don't see the same responsibility um, what they see is they have a responsibility to just indulge them uh, themselves, you know, to, to make more money, to, to grow things. And like, again, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, like I'm definitely on board with allowing people to, to, to grow companies and create wealth and, and all those sorts of things. I think it's a good thing to do, but 
I think though, you definitely have to find a way to nurture and 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 build up the rest of the uh, the rest of society, and yeah. that might mean giving nurturing your own competitor at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Like you have to be open to these sorts of things, uh, because if you don't give back to society, you know you don't give the things that the gifts that you share the gifts that you naturally have, uh, or just even the experiences that you've had. I I think it begins to kind of break down and. Um, you know, I, I don't think it functions as well. And so it's like, we can't be afraid to be leaders. That is the whole thing. Being a leader, I don't think is fun, actually. You know, building companies and all that stuff, that's great. It's, you, you get to be creative. You know, you're stretching yourself all the time. Negotiating deals. Like, Lee, I love negotiating deals. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, while I'm, while, while I'm overindulging uh, to make myself happy and do the things that I find just, you know, just so good. Someone else out there isn't getting what they need, you know, and, and, and they can't uh, perform to the level that they need to. And so I think, anyway, these are just like the things. I just think there's, you know, and balance is everything. Like you can't just be a coach or a nurturer. You have to keep growing yourself. Otherwise your lessons are stale, you know? Yeah. So it's, there's, there's a lot to it. It's just, we can't be opposed to it. And we, I just think that there's a responsibility to the wider village, you know, the, the community, to make sure that we um, that we're part of it, we're rooted in it, and help nurture it. Yeah, and then that's what makes you a, a real leader and an act, absolute inspirational. Um, like you're an inspirational mirror of faith right now, because you're you're building your business, but like I said, you're also making sure everybody um, wins around you. Yeah. Yeah, that's huge, man. Well, <laughs> there is a, there is a, there's a conference I was at a while ago, and um, the one guy at the front, he made sure, he made it very clear that um, no deal is ever struck that isn't win-win. And uh, it's not to say that these deals are great. It's just that, you know, you're getting something. You're not signing if you're getting zero. You know, like well, no, no one does yeah. that kind of thing. But and it can still be lopsided you're able to see the feedback in it all too. So you're always gaining, even if somebody says no to you, or if you experience something that somebody else might perceive as a fail, you're, you're experiencing it as feedback and you're actually taking it as feedback and you're rolling with it and growing with it. Like at the beginning of this, you were talking about even customers. Everybody's got a different opinion. Everybody's got this and that, and you're taking it as, 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 as areas where you can grow and gain. So like, you're utilizing even negative feedback as increment, as tools that enable you to grow. You know, uh, do you have time for a short story on negative feedback? Please. Okay. So when we first began, we, uh, we launched, uh, we began our marketing efforts in August of 2017. Yeah. And, uh, but we didn't begin operations until mid-September of 2017. So what we were doing as we were, well, we, we, I don't know, whatever. We had weird branding at the time, but we had this uh, sweet deals on wheels campaign that we were running. So we had these mini cupcakes that came from a, a chain of um, uh, cupcake restaurants called um, uh, Crave. And they, uh, they had our official company colors. Uh, the icing was in our official company colors. Uh, my business partner and I had these, uh, these work shirts that we wore. And um, we would just kind of set ourselves up on the street during lunch hour. And then we would just kind of meet the people, you know, and we would just uh, let them know who we were. Uh, and that included, uh, you know, in, in addition to the cupcakes, like behind us was like a car on one of our trailers and it had like a bow sitting on it. Uh, and then there was uh, some other swag that we handed out. And um, anyhow, the, the, and so we, we started off by saying we're an online dealership it was the first, uh, the first way that we were talking about ourselves. And there was this lady, it was like on, I think it was the first day. So she stops and she like, she had her hand hand out to reach for one of the cupcakes, right? Like she was like, mid cupcake. She's like, I'm gonna enjoy this cupcake. It's a nice thing. And then so she stops, she's like, what? You're an online dealership? And then she backs up about four feet. And uh, she, then she starts yelling at me. She says, uh, uh, well, I won't use all the words that she said, but uh, she said, you were, uh, you were effing me when you had a store and now you're trying to F me online? F you. And, uh, and that was it. And then she stormed off and she was just like, we're talking hands in the air. And she was angry. And this wow. is in front of people, the public. Yeah. And so, 
So I was like, okay, well, obviously, probably don't say dealership. Great, you know? So we, boom, we went through 1,200 people. Yeah. So, oh, sorry, I should say, I didn't know. Oh, hold on a second, Alex, you're cutting out. That moment that the word dealership was the problem. Okay. Oh, there you are. Oh, looks like internet's unstable. Oh. oh. Are we good? Uh, yeah. I can't see you, but I can hear you. Where'd you go? Oh, no. You coming back? I'm not sure. Oh. Under, hold on. Let me just stop the video for a second, and then I'll, I'll try. I'm at, <laughs> so we here? There you go. We're good? Yeah, we're good. So right. this lady freaked out, and um, you could have easily taken that on. You could have been mad at her. You could have called her the B word. You know, you could have done so many things, but you chose to actually see, oh, the word dealership triggered her. Yeah. And if I want her to buy a car, all I have to do is let go of that word and utilize a word that more so appeals to somebody because that word triggered that emotion. <laughs> She wouldn't even accept my cupcake that was delicious. Yeah, exactly. She Over a word. Even take the free cupcake. You know? <laughs> it's like, and they were good, you know? So <laughs> we, it, it, it wasn't until, uh, so we went through 1,200 like effective cold calls with people like this. And we got like, and I'll, I'll be frank with you, out of that 1,200, a lot of people reacted like that lady just with, you know, less swearing. And so she, um, but it, it was at a farmer's market, ironically enough, like a, a dealership at a farmer's market, right? That's amazing. And um, so we're, we're, anyway, I remember it was this day, um, it was my girlfriend at the time. She, uh, she innovated, like the line that we started using that really worked. And so she said, uh, she said, um, have you, she said, she said, hey, have you heard of Kirby? And so that was enough of a line to get people to stop, you know, from walking past us to be like, oh, they would engage. Be like, oh, hey, um, no, uh, what's it all about? Because it's just a friendly enough line that people will kind of stop, you know? So it's, it, it, it's disarming, I guess. So they stopped. And then she said, uh, oh, um, we sell cars online like Amazon. No, sorry, we sell cars online like Amazon sells books. And so then it was, and they're like, what? <laughs> like they're trying very desperately to process this. And so then uh, they're like, uh, how does that work? And so that was the question we got about 90% of the time was how does this work? Because they couldn't conceive it. It was like their brains were breaking, but now they're engaged. Wow. And now there's a chance to give out uh, swag. And yeah. um, so that was the thing. We was drawn this analogy. Another way that um, another way that we found was, you know, you could also put in front of it. That we're an on, we're Canada's first fully licensed online vehicle retailer. That's more of a line that we use with um, uh, with investors. Yeah. But it works really well too because the, with them they they bristle when you say car dealership. They just ugh, they hate it. Oh, but you're a, an online vehicle retailer. It's like oh well, interesting. Tell me more about that. Wow. You know? That's really cool because um, it wasn't necessarily the idea that was generating feedback, but how it was presented and you were able to catch that. How do you distinguish? This is a bad idea and I should stop or this is just presented a specific way and I just need to pivot that. Like, how do you, how do you distinguish the two? Oh this man, point? such a good question. I think um, it's a matter of the heart, you know, it's, um, I think you have to feel, see if it, well, there's two things. Um, I find it is a matter of the heart. Like if within me, I feel that this, I, I, if I can sense that this is the right path, so we have, we're, we're selling the right thing, then I think it's worth investigating, you know, again, taking the hits, <laughs> like the superhero, having the ladies on the street, the women on the street yell at you uh, so that you can, you can uncover what the truth is. Uh, and the heart always leads you to truth, I've found. Um, it sounds super cliche, but you know, if I, uh, I think it does though, it's, um, you know, it, yeah, you just gotta be brave um, and willing to go and like have those uncomfortable phone calls. But one thing that's interesting though, is no one ever leaves you. Like if you're, uh, you have to have to be perceptive, like 
definitely, you know, be in the, in the moment when the feedback is being delivered um, and really think about it afterwards too. Like you'll see patterns. And so the patterns that I've found, and, and we've, we've tried to launch things that never worked, you know, it's, uh, we've, we've abandoned them. Like, for example, I had this idea, uh, they called it uh, 007. And so it was, uh, it was it I, that, I thought cool. that was, yeah, that's, that's what I thought too. It's like, hey, great. You know, the, the whole idea was, you know, um, with, with Kirby, zero dollars down. Um, or was it uh, zero accidents? So all of our cars have zero accidents. And uh, you get seven days with the car. So effectively, you know, for, you get the car for seven days and there's no money out of your pocket. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and so there was a promotion for this. Then there was a, there was one hurdle that we needed people to overcome in order to take advantage of this whole thing, which is we just wanted them to have, give us a credit application. We weren't applying for credit. We just had to see if they could get credit. That was the whole thing. And um, it was very, unfortunately, challenging to sell because 007 itself was a fine thing to say. It's a little cheesy, like it's a little, I'd say off brand for us. Yeah. But when you got down to like, what does it mean? It kind of seemed like, I don't know, it was sort of, it was too dealershipy, I guess was the, the way I'd say it. <clears throat> yeah. Because it sounded like a promotion that one of our uh, more traditional competitors may have come up with. And, um, and that made, so we couldn't find the right words to describe that promotion properly. So we had to let it go. Even though, man, I thought it sounded pretty kick ass. I was just, uh, I was like, oh, that's right. <laughs> oh, I think that's awesome, man. I, I really love the way you're thinking and the way in which you operate. That's, that's very but, powerful. Know, yeah, but, <laughs> but do you see any of yourself in this? Because, uh, you know, one of my teachers uh, <laughs> was you. And, yes. Um, <laughs> so it's, um, and for me, that's full circle, right? Like, um, and this is like, I'm gaining so much self-realization by asking you these questions and hearing it all. So like, I, I'm, I'm super appreciative, like how much I'm learning through this process. And you're showing me areas of myself that now I can apply in the business world and chances are I'm going to get results. Yeah. Cause a, a lot of the stuff you're, you're describing I, I see that I do have these capabilities and most people actually do have these capabilities, which is really, really cool. The expression to which you're applying these principles is, is, is profound. And in the same way, like you say, um, like, you know, I, I've been able to teach you things. You've been able to take those teachings and apply them in this way. Now, now I'm able to observe you and apply the same lessons in a similar expression, if that makes sense. And anybody else that's watching, that's, really able to digest and absorb what you're actually saying, they're going to be able to do the same thing. Well, then I have probably the best compliment I hope I can give you right now, which is I'm just a reflection of you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's that simple, you know, that's why um, I'm really inspired by what you're doing because you're, you know, you're living proof of faith. You're showing me what I'm capable of. You're showing me that even when there's roadblocks, even when there's negative feedback, even when there's criticism, even when you don't have enough money or even when the money that you do have, you feel you need to preserve, that doesn't necessarily mean any of that is actually true. Yeah. And you're, you're shifting your relationship with money, how you see yourself, the world, you're shifting your relationship with how you see yourself as a leader. You're doing all this stuff, which is acting as living proof of faith. Cause the only reason I've been able to inspire anybody on this planet is through my actions. You know, my words are just yeah. the explanation of what I've done and what I am currently doing. And that seems to inspire a lot of people. And um, that's why I'm super excited to see what you're currently doing. Because um, I, too, am a fellow student. <laughs> but of course. <laughs> I, that, that, that's super. How do you know what the bottom line is now? Like you say, you cut a $10,000 check, right? So there you are. How, how much money do you need bottom line before, like, would you take your last penny in your bank account and put it forth? Well, I did <laughs> a while ago. Yes. So, um, uh, but, you know, I, I, I was able to recover, but I, I never, I don't have to do that anymore, which is really good. The, um, but yeah, good question. Like, how far do you go? Like, I, I've had this conversation with others. It, it's because it's, it's the whole idea, again, of, um, you know, uh, the, the advice to keep working as hard as you can, never give up. 
Um, and, I, and I think it's true. It's, you should never give up as long as it's the right thing to do. If, if, if persisting is the right thing to do, then spend your last penny. Because unfortunately, because if you don't, you'll feel empty. That's the crazy part, right? Because wow. you wouldn't have done everything you possibly could do. Yeah. But always very critically uh, evaluate what you're doing. Uh, if it's not going to be productive, if it's just going to maintain the status quo, um, like really understand your motivation. Like I'll, I'll be, you know, one thing I remember this, this came, I, I meditate every morning and there was a, a morning about a year and a half ago where I realized that I, I, I didn't, well, I found out that I'd been limiting myself. I didn't realize that how, by how much though, um, until it came to me that I was an entrepreneur, Alex was an entrepreneur, you know? And it's like, well, but hold on. That means I'm nothing else. I'm just an entrepreneur. And so I thought, oh my gosh, that's making my life empty. You know, I, I'm not an uncle, which is what I was. I, I'm an uncle three times over now. I wasn't an uncle. I wasn't a boyfriend. I wasn't a son. You know, I wasn't anything other than an entrepreneur. And that was interesting. It wasn't part of my identity. It was my identity. And if you're an entrepreneur only, then your company can never die because if it does, you got nothing left. And I think that that means that uh, it makes a person more risk averse. I think it makes them make decisions that will uh, say preserve capital or cash or whatever you have. Um, when what you really need to be doing is, is investing or t changing tack or trying something different. Because as long as they have a company, whether it's functioning well or not, then you, know, you can be satisfied. And so I think for me, it was important to shed that old mindset because um, just for occasions like COVID-19, um, like we don't know what's going to happen and it's very possible the company won't survive. But, you know, we have more to talk about. We have something that I believe that's more investable by the way we're doing what we're doing. So, you know, it's like a, like having a business isn't enough for me anymore. You know, wow. it's having something... <laughs> I got my phone ringing. I turned it off, but it's still ringing. Yes. So just simply, it, it's I need more than just having a business. It's got to be, it's got to be the thing I want it, that it needs to be. Um, and then, and and on that note, from my experience, I I do believe that uh, companies take on a life of their own. Um, I believe that it just seems to be the case. They become what they're supposed to be, and we don't necessarily, or I haven't necessarily been driving that. Um, I've been responding to what it needs to make it what it's supposed to be. I, I don't, uh, it's kind of roughly analogous to trying to choose a profession for your child. Yeah. You know, like, you, yep, you can totally, you know, twist their arm and make them into whatever you want them to be, a doctor, an engineer, like, you know, whatever it is, right? Because uh, these seem to be the professions where people do that sort of thing. Um, or you can just let them grow on their own and they'll tell you what they need in order to, or in order to become that, an artist or like, or the engineer or the doctor or whoever, you know, it's like that lawyer, um, you know, it's just facilitated. That's the best you can do. Uh, in the, in the case of Kirby, it, it got away from you very, but very quickly. Um, I had the, you know, when we did our projections and we saw how the company would work, we both believe my business partner and I, we both believe that we could with the two of us build a, um, you know, a tightly run, uh, organically grown um, online vehicle retailer. And what we found out within about, it was less than 12 months, that was an interesting pipe dream. Uh, this is a very high cap game. There is money flowing around that if we didn't take advantage of, other competitors would, and then they would eat our lunch. And so it's like, man, like, do we want to be competing? eating with the guys that don't even exist today that took the investment money uh, or do we want to take the money, you know, and, and not even have them ever appear on the radar. It's like, and these are the things. And so it's, you know, so it took us into a wholly different direction. Um, but yeah. And it, again, we did, we, we were part, we, par we participated in that, but it was like nature <laughs> was making this happen. It was nuts. <laughs> Dude, that's so phenomenal. That's it's really powerful. You've, you've <laughs> given a lot of gold today. Like, um, yeah, like the, with that mindset, I, I I truly believe um everybody can thrive. Oh, I think you're right. It's uh, <laughs> you know, and but that's the re that's the reason why doing what you do is so important. I would say, 
because uh, you're providing that coaching and that direction, that mentorship. Uh, I can guarantee you that uh, I never knew, you know, until you told me that I was a reflection, that you were a reflection of me one time. Um, you know, I never, I, that never meant anything before that. I never heard it before, but now I get it. And so these are the reasons why we have to, we, we must not be afraid to give back and we have to be more importantly, not selfish. It makes so, so much sense, man. And like, just to even dive deeper into that, what's really cool is um, you're looking at what I've observed in this conversation is to break down how all these obstacles are a reflection of you you're seeing them as possibilities what's possible with this and why that's a reflection is because that's literally how you're seeing the world how you're seeing your capabilities you, you are fully 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 capable so everything is a reflection of you um <laughs> limiting be, feeling limited by the situation is literally a limiting belief because it's, it's 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 a limiting belief on one's own capability so you're utilizing all this stuff as feedback as possibilities and that's just a reflection of your confidence and what you believe in yourself. Well, um, I think, uh, you know, limiting beliefs are easy to have um, and they're very subtle. You know what I mean? Like it, it's, it's, you sometimes don't even know you have them. I mean, as, sorry, I should say I've discovered I didn't know I had them. I didn't realize being an entrepreneur, you know, as an identity was a limiting thing. I thought it was a, a great thing, you know? Yeah. Um, but one thing uh, that I, I truly do believe, and, um, and maybe actually you, let me know what you think about this, but I remember when I cut that check for $10,000, the, the one that, that, that helped me build the confidence to keep, you know, just to try something else, you know? Yeah. And it was um, what I was trying to get built at that time. It was a real thing. And I thought it was a good idea. I just knew that it wasn't I just knew that it would be, it wasn't what I really wanted to do. I, 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 had, a, I, I had a desire for something different, but this was the, the smallest thing I could possibly get going. And still, um, it, was, it, was the, it was the first step, I guess, is, the, is what it was. But what I realized was, it, this thought came to me one morning after I was doing yoga every morning at the time and meditating. And, and what came to me was, if the worst thing that happens in this world you know, is that when you put something out there, you know, and you get it back, because that seems to be the way it goes. You get back what you put out, right? So if I put a lot of effort into working out, I'll get, you know, I'll get in better shape. If I, if I challenge myself on a daily basis with, you know, with other things that challenge my identity and who I am, uh, I'll get back a stronger version of myself, right? And so you, all that effort gets returned. So I thought like, if the worst thing that happens is I put something of myself out there, I'll get it back. And I thought like, that's interesting. Like getting that echo back from the world um, would be maybe everything. And so, and I just, I, I had to see what that was all about. And, and that's where the $10,000 went. Just like these small little, I mean, I guess they're kind of mental hacks for me, but just something that just, I, I don't know. Dude, I there, there's, there's a science to that too. It's, you know, you break it down in physics. You're looking at that now as something that comes in full circle. And, um, you know, our belief systems really structure the caliber of our experience. So you're able to notice how it comes back as well, because, you know, it's like a, it's like a flawless law. However, um, if you don't see it, how can you experience it? Right. So by opening up your mind like that, you're able to see it. And that's reminding me of a lot. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure, man. How, how can people find you? How can people find Kirby? Um, what does you do? Stand up. Let's see your shirt. <laughs> you're gonna see my COVID nineteen here. Hold on. <laughs> yes, Kirby. Yeah. So is it? What is it? Kirby dot com, Kirby dot ca. Yeah, we're at uh, Kirby dot ca. So Kirby that's C U R B I E dot C A. Uh, you can also find us on Instagram and Facebook at Kirby Cars. Man, that's amazing. Dude, thank you so much for, for coming on here and sharing everything that you're doing. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to watching you grow with this. This is, it's cool. The mindset that, you're, that you have now, like you got with you for the rest of your life, and that's only going to grow. I'm super excited to see where this takes you. Oh, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure chatting. And yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm grateful we've stayed in contact over all these years. Um, Likewise, brother. Yeah. 
and Thank yeah, you. you and Lasha and Teddy uh, and the dogs are <laughs> are fantastic people. I want to, I definitely want to, you know, hang out with you as soon as as soon as we can. Absolutely. Uh, but, you know, in our post COVID world, hopefully. Post COVID world, it'll happen. It'll happen, brother. If there's one thing you could um, leave everybody with, what would that be? Hmm. That's a good question. What do you leave people with? Hmm. There's one piece of advice for anybody that's struggling right now that feels that they can't and they want to. You know, I think, uh, I mean, it's going to, again, it might be cliche, but I, I think uh, running towards the fear is the way to do things. I think there's a lot of, um, uh, yeah, there's a, it, whatever, wherever the resistance is, that's where the growth tends to be. Uh, it also tends to be, from my vantage point, like where the truth is. The tricky thing is, though, identifying fear. Uh, and I know for me, like, you know, people will say, well, of course, I don't want to be in a, a tiger's cage because the tiger can kill me. And it's like, yeah, that's a rational fear. That, don't worry about that one. You know, it's like, yeah. that's <laughs> you know, yeah. that's a fear that makes sense. It's the, it's the fears that don't make sense. Those are the ones you have to look out for. But the thing about the fear, though, at least in my life, what I found is it manifests in many different ways. So on the one hand, it could be legitimate, like, I'm stopped. I can't say the words that I want to get out but it can also manifest as like ah do I feel like working out today you know I just uh, not sure if I really want to do that or inconvenience even it's like ah man but if I I gotta get in my car then I gotta drive all the way down to the gym then I gotta change then I gotta work out and then I'll I gotta shower because I'll be all I'll be all sweaty it's gonna take all this time and so the thing is like I found that those types of those things echo through my life with everything else that I do. It could be like a business event. It's like, ah, do I really want to go and do this thing? I got to be on for the next hour uh, or next two hours. Then I have to, you know, somehow synthesize this, then follow back. And man, am I going to remember this guy's kids? You know, it's just like all kinds of things that just kind of make, make you not want to do a thing, you know, just let, let's not, it's like, basically it's like, Anything that makes my life smaller is the fear, is what I've thematically, you know, managed to put together. So find the things, if I'm leaving uh, people with something, find the things in your life that make your life smaller, that, and usually, from that, I think what they also try to do is stop action. Anything yeah. that makes your life smaller, limits action, those are the things you absolutely have to do. Wow, man. Perspective is key, guys. If you guys, enjoyed watching this hit subscribe we're gonna get some more cool people like this alex thank you so much man hey, thank you so much please it's been a pleasure absolutely man take care we'll talk soon cheers buddy bye all right brother